Christian rackets. He said as a strong man. However, he only had one arrest in all that time for suspicion of robbery in 1935. He did rise through the ranks uh, to become boss of Cicero, uh, of the bookies, I'm sorry, the bookies in Cicero, and was later brought to run in the mob's biggest gambling joint and nightclubs in Cicero, the 4811 Club. He was jailed in 1952 for his complete lack of cooperation before the Kefauver Senate Committee uh, hearings investigating organized crime. If you want to, I would tell you to go to, uh, I'll try to put it on this tape, but go to YouTube and look it up. I mean, he was just, I mean, he did everything but spit at the, at the senators. I mean, he was just obnoxious. So the committee sentenced him to six months in jail, fined him a thousand dollars, which would be roughly around ten thousand today, for refusing to answer questions. And in 1957, he was jailed for a year uh, when his business partner failed to register with the government as dealers of gambling devices. So, in 1976, Iopa, he's now 69 years old. He's at the top of the commission chart uh, as the boss of Chicago mob. Iopa was a widower. He had no children. He lived alone on a five-acre suburban lot. But he was an avid hunter. He made yearly trips to the Canadian backwoods to pursue the hobby. If it sounds like I'm reading this, I am. It's something I wrote a long time ago, and it's a lot easier for me to read this to you than um, pretend I'm an actor and put voice into it. I don't know how to do that. So I'm just going to read to you what I wrote. A lot of research went into this. It's good stuff. So he picked up the name Joey Doves, which is, you know, pretty much just used in the, in the press and from official Washington for tra transporting morning doves unlawfully across state lines. Uh, in October 2, 1962, Bobby Kennedy was all over this guy's ass, all over his ass. And he had wildlife agents uh, stop him and they found uh, fowl, 563 fowl, dressed and stuffed in his gangster. So... <laughs> Iopa was proud of the fact that, that he and his men uh, had killed these doves during a Kansas hunting trip by using shotguns and automatic rifles to shoot the birds off power lines. Oy. So he was convicted uh, of illegal transportation. Bobby Kennedy saw that and he got three months in jail. Uh, the conviction, of course, was later overturned by the Court of Appeals because it was just plain weird. But it put the Chicago mob on warning in, uh, in 1961, 62, 63 that Kennedy wasn't going to fool around with him. Ayupa was a power in the mob for a long time. He's widely considered to have ordered the deaths of Sam Giancana in 1975 and Tony Spilatro in 1986. He is thought to have ordered the murder of Giancana in retaliation for Giancana's refusal to grant Ayupa and Arcota, who was actually boss, a percentage of the proceeds for his illegal gambling operations down in Mexico and Iran. He had them all over the world, gambling ships. It's more likely uh, Gene Connor was killed because he made a lot of remarks about not serving another day in jail. And to the guys in the Chicago mob, it's not like he was going to flip if pushed. You can't blame him. I mean, Gene Connor was in really bad physical shape. Uh, he was in no condition to go to jail. Uh, he had been t essentially tossed out by the mob. They didn't want to have anything to do with him. Um, and they could have saved him from doing the year in jail he did prior to going to Mexico, but they didn't. And they told him he couldn't save himself. So uh, I could see that where they, if, if they had some goods on him and said, look, Sam, Gene Conna, tell us what it is or go to jail. I get you. He said, yeah, fine, I'll tell you what you want to know. I was pretty pissed off at Arcota. I spoke to some guys who were friends of Sam Gene Conna's. They loved the guy, by the way. I mean, he was a nut, but still they loved him. And they cursed Arcota. I mean, they, they really hated him. They blamed Arcota for everything that happened to Sam Giancana. Anyway, in 1985, Arcota, 40 other guys were subpoenaed to testify before the President's Commission on Organized Crime that was looking into this massive gambling operation Chicago had going on. It brought them around, they think, 40 million bucks a month in 1985. And that was mostly from them being the mob. That was mostly from sporting and horse racing events. It was just an incredible amount of money. In 1986, Iupa, his underboss was Jackie Cherone, and several other mobsters from Chicago, Kansas City, were indicted for skimming millions from the Las Vegas casinos. Let me stop here and tell you 
one bad guy said, you know, they were looking for us to skim the money on the outside. We didn't need that money. We had money. It was, it was where we would put the money to be able to clean it. And no one was watching the front door. So according to him, they were sneaking millions and millions of dollars into the casinos in the front door, but nobody cared about that. They were all fascinated, the FBI guys, on what they were bringing out the back door, the cleaned money that they said they were stealing. But anyway, the indictments are released uh, uh, for this operation for skimming the millions and uh, for street taxes paid by bookies, uh, gambling houses, burglars, everyone had to, were increased by around 25%. So they went around all the bad guys in Chicago, and guess what? Your protection rackets are going, our rates are going up. And if a bad guy said, I don't pay protection rackets, they said, well, you know, congratulations. Uh, loan sharks were levied as well by the outfit. Uh, not everybody uh, thought this was a good idea. They wouldn't agree to it. And Chucky English, Lenny Yaris, Hale Smith were all killed within five weeks because they just whined about it. On January 10, 1985, Lenny Yaris, his father was said to, Dave Yaris is said to play some role in the Kennedy assassination. I, I, if you believe that sort of thing, I don't know. But anyway, Lenny Yaris, he's the son of the legendary Dave Yaris. He's murdered as he made his usual round collecting a street tax from the bookies in Roger Park, the same area his father had worked in 50 years ago. He refused to pay off on that. It later came out that Lenny Yaris was known principally as a street collector for bookmakers and gamblers, uh, and he may have been active in the narcotics trade. And that, you know, that could have led to his murder as well. His father was considered a major uh, narcotics importer in the 1940s, which could have put him in touch with the Corsican mobs, you know? So anyway, young Yaris pulls his car up to 4224 West Davidson Street, Division Street, he steps into the A1 Industrial Uniform Company, which was a large laundry shop, and he had a piece of that. And he said that was his main line of work, that he was a consultant there. I don't know why you would be a consultant to a, a laundry, do you? Uh, he came back at 10 a.m. He uh, came back to his car. He enters his automobile, and as soon as he shut the door, a tan Chevy swings up uh, in front of the car, blocks him off. And two men wearing ski masks got out and they opened fire into Yaris's face. Uh, they shot him four times, once in the throat, four times in the face. So Yaris uh, fell towards the passenger side and was shot two more times, once in each leg. Jeez. So some of the bullets missed and went through him or broke the passenger side's windows. Yaris slumps down a bundle of files and calendars and he's dead. The gunman went back to the car um, and drove away. Uh, it turned out that somebody got the license plate, but it had been stolen the day before from uh, suburban Burbank, Illinois. I don't know where that is. Anyway, uh, it was well, the, the car was is found. Why did they, they kill out. Yaris? And uh, people have somehow dragged the Kennedy assassination into this. Here's what's going on. Yaris lived in a condo at 6400 North Cicero Avenue in Lincolnwood, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago. And he was a partner occasionally with Joe DiVarco. Di uh, mob guy. An hour before Yaris was killed, DeVarco, who had been on trial for tax evasion and was found guilty, uh, was ordered into federal custody as a danger to the community under a law that's seldom used, but it, it, then, it's used now actually, that the defendant be jailed, that he be jailed, DeVarco, immediately after his conviction because they said he posed some sort of a, a threat to the community. I don't know why a gambler would do that. Uh, even if you post bail, you still have to go. Yaros had once considered, regarded uh, DeVarco as his lieutenant, but Yaros had moved up in the world, and now he was operating at, a, you know, about the same level as DeVarco. So while Yaros was recognized as the gambling boss of Rogers Park and the North Suburban areas, DeVarco ran gambling in the near north side and the very lucrative Rush Street. Police suspected, guys on the street suspected, that Yaros had secretly provided the information that convicted DeVarco because he wanted his gambling territories. Federal investigators said, no, no, nothing could be further from the truth and so forth. But it would explain his murder, wouldn't it? Just as a side note, 11 years before Yaros was murdered, his brother, uh, Ronnie, I think the younger brother, was murdered on April 18, 1974. He ran massage parlors down in Miami Beach. And he was shot dead in his home by persons unknown. 
Three months before that, his father, their father, Dave Yars, old-time mob guy, suffered a heart attack while he was out playing golf uh, in Miami. Uh, Yaris, the father, was probably the getaway driver on the January 20, 1983 murder of Alan Dorfman in, in Chicago. And they had been, uh, he may have, Dorfman may have been threatening mob guys by saying, I'll testify about what I knew and so forth. And if he did, Ayupa and Saron would go to jail. So <laughs> they killed him. Second side note to that is that Yaris is actual killer, police think. Or retired police have told me was probably just some junkie but they picked up uh, they knew he was strung out he died of a drug overdose several months after the killing in Florida uh, police suspect he was murdered but uh, so just something. another theory was that the reason uh, Dave Yaris was murdered outside the laundry was that he, the Italian-American fraction of the Chicago outfit, just didn't want to work with Jarvis, who's a Jew. They, don't, they didn't understand why he got to collect the street taxes because at one time the North Side had been heavily Jewish and they thought, well, those days are gone. It's ours now. I, I don't think that's, I don't know about that. I mean, the, the mob fractions in Chicago have ethnically have always worked well. It's incredible how, work, how well they've worked in the past. Uh, the murder was more than probably inspired by Joe Fiorello, who was racing towards the outfit leadership, and he felt that the aging hoods who were there had to go, and things had to change, and he needed money. Uh, there was a mob informer who told the Chicago Crime Commission that Fiorello said, quote, things are coming apart in Chicago, and something has to be done about it. So, always paranoid, it was Fiorello's belief that bookies and collectors were working together, led by Yaris somehow, to withhold all the street taxes. Well, he was. Yaris was withholding the tax, but Yaris was the blatant leader of the group. Dave Red O'Malley, who was serving a 10-year sentence at a federal uh, Metropolitan Correction Center for an unrelated extortion conviction in 1970, was arrested and eventually acquitted in the Yaris murder, largely because the judge found too many inconsistencies in the prosecution's witnesses who placed O'Malley at the scene of the slaying. Others didn't. Uh, the witness gave different accounts about the type of mask the killer had on, what he wore, what he didn't wore. Uh, when asked to identify the man, uh, one witness said was at the scene. He couldn't spot O'Malley. He was just five feet away from him. So on February 10, 1985, just a month after Yaris is killed, the body of a gambler, Hale H. Smith, was found in the trunk of his car in suburban Arlington Heights. This was a really brutal, he had been beaten badly and his throat was cut. Um, and the rumor was he had simply stopped paying taxes. He thought things are such a mess with the mob nowadays, Yaris is having his, he just stopped paying. And so they killed him and it was a brutal murder, by the way. Uh, they found him in the trunk of his Cadillac. He, and as, as I said, he had also been strangled Prior. He actually died of strangulation. The stabbing was unnecessary. He had vanished two nights before, and he told his wife he was going to go out and meet Bill Jehoda, who was a gambler associated uh, outfit gambler at the Village Tavern, a restaurant grove. I had the displeasure of talking with Jehoda many times when he was in the witness protection program in Washington. Uh, I, I, I thought he was, I'm sorry, a fucking loon. Um, you know, his conversation, he, he lived with two huge German shepherds and we'd be talking on the phone and he'd start out normal. Uh, and then he would just start, I think he was coked up and he would just start screaming into the phone. So I, in those days we had receivers, I put the phone down and could hear him from across the room. I mean, he was that crazy. And the more he yelled, the louder he got. These two enormous dogs would <laughs> bark and drown him. I simply never talked to him again. He would call all the time, and I just thought, oh, my God, I, I don't need this. Anyway, uh, where they found Smith's body was on the border of Chicago. And since most of the leaders uh, lived in the general area, they, uh, they tried to keep it out of there. Uh, to make sure that was understood, in 1962, there were two hoods, Jimmy Maglara and Bill McCarthy, who were both 24, inadvertently chased two men and women into Elmwood Park, where all the big bosses live, and he killed them there. Both were later tortured and murdered 
by Alfred Killers uh, as a lesson to keep your crime out of the places in where the bosses live. In 1985, what, 10 years after the murder uh, of Hal Smith, the government indicted uh, Robert Salerno, a one-time boxer and an Alfred Slugger thug, Rocky and Felice, uh, an Alfred boss, and Robert Bellavia and Salvador De Laurentiis were convicted of conspiring to murder Smith. So it was a bizarre trial, even by Chicago's long history of bizarre trials. Salerno was represented by his son, who was a legitimate defense lawyer. And Legerno, uh, Salerno stood up and said, I'm proud to defend my father. At which point Salerno, whether it was practice, I don't think it was practice, stood up from the defense table, took a long bow, and then he said loudly, pleased to meet you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> the younger Salerno then said, I wanted to help him, not because he's my father, but because he's always helped me. Well, that would be because he's your father. I probably know him better than anyone in the world, and I do not believe he killed anyone. He's always taught me to obey the law. To which the older Salerno added, I'm no angel, but I didn't kill this guy. The government witness was, again, Crazy Bill Jehoda. He had been, Jehoda, when they say he was a newspaper man, he, he worked for one of those suburban newspapers. They're not much around anymore. And it was mostly feature stories. Anyway, he turned into a gambler and then what he was best at, an informant. Let me say something in fairness. I have a friend who I respect a great deal who's retired from the Chicago PD, organized crime unit from the 70s, 80s. He liked Jehoda, another writer I knew, uh, liked him a great deal. Uh, they were good friends. They spoke weekly. So I'm just going to level the playing field up by saying that. But anyway... So Jehoda says not only had Smith, Hal Smith, the guy they butchered, refused to pay the six grand a month in, in uh, street tax, he got into a loud argument in a restaurant with uh, Salvador De Laurentiis. De Laurentiis is pissed. He waits outside in the parking lot. He's walking back and forth. Hal Smith comes out and he screams at him. He goes, you, my friend, are trunk music. Trunk music is the Chicago way. They murder people and toss them in the trunk. It's something they're fond of doing. So... Jehoda told the court that he, Jehoda, lured Smith to his home in a place called Long Grove, Illinois, on orders from Rocky and Felice, mob boss. And Jehoda said that Smith was marked for death, but I'm quoting Jehoda here. I didn't know it was a serious meeting. Oh, come on. Jehoda directed Smith to drive his car into the garage of his house, of his attached house. And uh, he said that Rocky and Felice told him to make sure Smith entered the house alone. Jehoda says Jehoda, was not to uh, be there. He said that once once Smith had driven into his garage, he said, look, I got to drive down the street and pick up my mail. I don't believe it. I think he was there. But I think Jehoda walked into the house and partook in it, but whatever. So Jehoda left the house, and when he says he looked through the window, this is how weak this story is, he saw Salerno, who's all dressed in black, come up from behind Hal Smith as Hal Smith entered the kitchen, and he grabbed him. Later, he said that Hal Smith had been knocked to the floor in days, and the killers had slashed his throat repeatedly, punctured his body with a knife, and then strangled him to death. Wow. At the prosecutor's instruction during the testimony, Jehoda uh, placed toy figures. They went out and got a model of the house, and he, he placed figures on where all this <laughs> had happened. Four years after the murder, Jehovah began working full-time for the government. In one tape meeting with Robert, Bil Robert Bilavia, uh, who was also in the house of Smith was killed, Jehovah asked Smith uh, if, if Smith uh, had been alive in the kitchen, to which Bilavia says, Oh, no, uh, it was right there, just out and over right there. Um, just an incredible, isn't it? So, three days after Smith was found dead, Chucky English it was a one-time capo under Sam Giancana, one of Sam Giancana's favorite guys, was gunned down as he walked to his car to his parking lot at a Harvest restaurant at 1850 Harlem Avenue in Elmwood Park. Um, it, that murder and surprised He was him. under Giancana's rule. Uh, English, his real name was Inglesia. Uh, he was in charge of counterfeit music recording, coin-operated vending machines, gambling. He grew rich under Giancana. And he ruled things on the west side in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And he was once, on record anyway, the owner of Lormar Distributing Company. You may see that occasionally if you watch television shows from the 60s. Anyway, they sold phonographic equipment, tape decks. Most of them were stolen uh, uh, and 
resold illegally. But anyway, the whole thing was this huge front for this juice loans for gamblers. In the 1950s, when English was called before the Senate Rackets Committee, which is investigating the jukebox industry, um, he took the fifth repeatedly. You know, the jukebox industry today, we it's really not much at all, if anything. But from the uh, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, it was a big deal. Uh, most diners had a jukebox. Uh, kids flocked around these things, um, and they would stuff as they did in the case of Frank Sinatra, re-record his records, the New Jersey mobsters, and put him into these jukeboxes. And of course, they'd pay him a dime. And when it went up, they manu when his sales went up, they manufactured more of the records and sold them, and uh, uh, Sinatra didn't get paid on that. The whole thing was incredibly corrupt, and it was a nationwide network. Anyway, three years after Giancana dies, English said he was going into semi-retirement. He moved to Hallandale, Florida, which is to do uh, golfing and deep sea diving. Uh, during the summers, he'd come back to Chicago, but otherwise he lived in a 10 room, two story Mediterranean place with a swimming pool, mind you, in River Forest. When he bought the house, uh, a, the real estate agent told IRS guys that he turned over 5,000 in earnest money in cash. And he said, don't worry, there's a lot more where that came from. Uh, I don't know <clears throat> if somebody as smart as English in dealing with cash with an outsider would actually say something like that. Perhaps the, the real estate guy was making things up. But anyway, uh, he eventually paid cash for the house, which is incredible. Uh, why he was killed, he was 70 years old, on the eve of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. People have made a lot out of that. There's nothing to it. It's just one of those coincidences. Some say he was trying to expand his gambling rackets. I sincerely don't think so. Uh, he was too old. He was too rich. He just didn't need it. It was a game at this point. Others say that the young Turks in the in the outfit had gotten permission to take him out and take over his operations, which were kind of extensive. He, even one of his games, his gambling things, was big money. Maybe Farola ordered the murder, and some speculated Joey Lombardo because English was so quick in turning over his te street taxes for our, for our, Ferrello, I'm sorry, instead of Lombardo. Lombardo, who was, you know, a little shaky, uh, just said, all right, kill him. Um, it, it depends. The problem was in all of that is Ferrello really didn't like Chucky English. So uh, the Chicago mob noted the two of them had had a falling out uh, and that on the night he was murdered, some of Ferrello's guys I assume, and so does just about everybody else, followed um, English to Bruno's, a gas station where the mob hung out. It was across the street from the Elmwood Park restaurant where he had been, and, he, and they gunned him down. They killed him there. Detectives, of course, were trailing him at the time, and they said there was apparently a very cold relationship between English and Joe Farello, who likes to take over everything. English was there, so were the other regulars, among them Dominic Cortina, the saying there at the gas station. Don Angelina, George Cotulio, who I've never heard of. Farola shows up, here's what he did. He walked right past English, he didn't look at him. Goes right into the gas station like English wasn't there. That meant a lot to me, the detective said. It showed us who was strong and who wasn't. English stood around a while, then he walked away, got in his Cadillac and left. The boys weren't talking to him. So, returning to the day that uh, Chucky English was killed, sort of a big day in Chicago mob him, uh, history, uh, because he was a he was a major player for a long time. But anyway, um, by the way, it had been common knowledge that he was telling people um, English that uh, it was him that should have been running things instead of Ferrello, that he should have been running all the all the suburban gambling, blah blah blah. English, by the way was a prime suspect in the 1975 murder of Sam Giancana, his old and so forth beloved boss in Giancana's Oak Park home. Uh, the home is still there, by the way. You can drive by. It looks exactly like it did when Sam Giancana was killed there. There's another argument that says that uh, English was exiled because he refused to set Giancana up for the, for the kill. The FBI says that he was either certainly the killer or set the killing up. One of the people nobody knows. Um, now back to the actual reason he, English was probably killed in all actuality, was that the investigators 
believed that he was trying to organize some independent bookies under his supervision. Uh, they, Farola said, well, I'll kill you if you do that. It was a big falling out. It never got patched up. Uh, and Farola earlier, by the way, uh, after Giancana was said was murdered, he told English to get out of town or I'll kill you. And then later on, he tacitly agreed for English to return to Chicago for the summers. So who knows what happened. But that afternoon, he went to Horvath's, Horwitz restaurant in suburban Emerald, Illinois, as I said. It was around 3 o'clock. That place was later firebombed in 1982 for reasons unknown. Um, it was demolished, and there's a staple supply store there the last time I was there. Anyway, at around 3.30, about a half an hour after uh, English arrives, the owner brings up a huge roast pig for his regular customers, and he had invited English to drop by and have it. English shared a table with 13 guests, including two, two Cook County judges, uh, the village trustee, uh, labor leader John Lardino, who was you know, will have to be uh, screwed into his grave, he was that crooked. It was Lardino's birthday. Uh, English was a former client of, of uh, one of the judges. Um, so at around six o'clock, English says thank you and so forth. He stands up, pats his stomach, hitched up his belt, waves goodbye, and walked towards his Cadillac. Two men, one who was older, one was younger, sitting at a different table, walked out a few seconds later. They paid uh, English's portion of the bill, so nobody knows what that's about. Those two men didn't follow English to his car, and the reason was as soon as English reached his car door, he was parked 50 feet or so from the front door for those fruit two men who followed him out. Two guys wearing ski masks walked up and pumped him full of five holes, and they shot him in his eye, his forehead, his nose, left eyebrow, his right cheek, and once in the back, who the hell knows for good measure. Um, there was a car waiting for them. They hopped in the car. They took off. Police later found the car they had driven there, and it was an impounded car, and um, it led nowhere. There were no fingerprints or anything else. Uh, they suspected a silencer was used, and they had gotten it from a place called Hans Buchhofer in Elk Grove, who had a long, long history of supplying the mob with uh, with silencers and weapons and all that so sort of thing. So back to Iopa's trial for skimming the casinos. That began on September 23rd, almost two years to the day after uh, Iopa had been indicted with the others. Um, although they tried to, the Hoods, tried to delay the trial as long as they could. They said they needed additional time, which is understandable because the FBI had booked 4,000 hours of surveillance tape. Imagine that, from bug telephones, hidden microphones. It was a four-year investigation before they decided to bring charges. They wanted this to be a lock-solid case. Uh, during those four years, the FBI also followed the money couriers who left the casinos in Vegas and uh, met with mobsters at, uh, in parking lots and followed them to Iopa's home in Oak Brook. So in other words, I wasn't clear on that. The courier would leave. He'd meet a mob guy in a parking lot in Chicago. He'd hand over the money. The guy, the Chicago guy, would go over to Iopa's home and drop the money off. During the trial, um, other defendants and their attorneys, they, they showed Iopa a great deal of respect. He listened closely, but only when other mob guys were talking. When the government pulled up its other witnesses, he, he literally fell asleep and snored. So they, and they had to wake him up because he was a, a loud snore. Uh, Alan Ackerman, who was Iopa's attorney, later told the court the government used details supplied by an unnamed uh, informant and blah, 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 and that wasn't right. The unnamed informant was Carl Thomas. Thomas. He was a Las Vegas uh, casino owner, all-around guy in Vegas. He testified he took 80000 in cash from a casino counting room and gave it to the Chicago emissary. Um, he also told the jury that he was skimming the profits that took place in five Las Vegas casinos, and the mob got millions of dollars from the Teamsters funds in the 1970s, which was uh, new information. So, uh, Thomas had been convicted earlier for his role in the scheme of the Kansas City mos uh, mobsters to skim the other casinos. He got a 15-year prison sentence for that. And then he was indicted in the Stardust Casino Conspiracy, but that was dropped. And then his previous conviction was reduced to time served. 
and probation. So it was a sweet deal for him. Among the key witnesses was Alan Glick, who purchased the Stardust. He had been in commercial real estate, and he was a friend of, of uh, Milwaukee uh, for, uh, mobster's son and so forth. So he was put up at front. He knew what he was doing, I think. So he purchased the Stardust Casino in the fall of 1974 for $62 million on a loan he got from the Teamsters Pension Fund. The mob, of course, had worked all that out. So Glick testified when he first asked about the loan, uh, about, you know, started asking, understandably, $62 million in 1974 is a lot of money. They said, look, don't worry about it. The man to see is Frank Ballesteri, who's the boss of the Milwaukee mob. Everything's fine. Don't worry. Uh, he said in 19, he clicks in 1975, he learned that Nick Savella, the Kansas City mob boss, also had obtained loans for his friend Roy Williams, uh, from his friend Roy Williams at the Teamsters, uh, and that they later promoted, they, the mob promoted him to union president. So Glick takes control of the casino, and he, he's asking more and more questions, and Frank Rosenthal, um, you may have seen him in the, in the film Casino. He's played by Robert, uh, whatever that guy's name. So he tells him, look, mind your business. Stay away from the casino. Don't even show up. We don't need you here. Be quiet. Walk away. Um, Wiretaps backed up that story. I want to tell you, I've said this before. I had conversations with Rosenthal. I thought he was a smarmy little wise ass. I, I didn't care for him at all. <clears throat> you know, a lot of these mob guys are really nice guys. I know. I shouldn't say that, but they're, it's hard not to like a lot of them. And that's how they make their money. You know, it's, you get to like them and they say, hey, why don't you take $10 or why don't you come over here? And they get you in that way. Nobody follows these guy, mob guys around because they're mean. You know, they, they win you over that way. In my experience, most of them were nice guys and they knew I wasn't going to get involved with anything, but they were, they were pretty good to me. But I just felt that Rosenthal was kind of a, a rattlesnake. Um, that was my opinion. But anyway, it turns out Tony Spilatro, who you also probably saw from the movie Casino, was really giving day-to-day -day instructions to hotel officials at the Stardust on how he wanted things run. Uh, he told them what position to give a guy. In one example, there was a guy he owed a favor to. He calls the casino manager. He look, give this fool a job, but pay him $22 an hour, which is low pay, by, excuse me, and uh, put him on a third shift so he'll quit. And then on other calls, he can be heard giving names of people that he wanted to, to comp to give free rooms and drain show tickets uh, at the Stardust. Um, where they got all this, where they got most of it, was inside the Gold Rush Jewelry Store, which Spilacho ran and figured was perfectly safe. He could say whatever he wanted. Well, it wasn't. Uh, Glick, Alan Glick, lived through it all, which just amazes me they didn't kill him. He was forced to sell his interest in the casino by the state. Um, <laughs> just, uh, uh, Teamster President Roy Williams also testified. He hoped that he would get a reduction for a 10-year sentence he was facing on bribery. It didn't do anything for him. And then the Cleveland mob boss, Angelo Leonardo, who was already in prison on a narcotics charge, testified for the government. Considered an heir and to the he crime syndicate thrown in Chicago has, as of late, been a liability, Lester. according to mafia observers. Brother, he is to be retried. In 1981, Cerrone and Ayupa, Angelo Leonardo, I just spoke about, Alan Rockman, from the Cleveland mob, they met in a hotel room to discuss who they would name the new Teamster president. Uh, Frank Fitzsimmons was on his deathbed. He had lung cancer. He was on the way out. And they were looking for a, a successor that they could manage without a problem. Cleveland wanted that to go to Roy Williams, who was the international vice president. And as part of the deal, Williams would name Jackie Presser, who was the vice president from Cleveland, to a powerful position within the union. But Ayupa and Cerrone, they were, they, they they were right not to trust anything. pressure because, after all, he had been, uh, unknown to them, an FBI informant for, I think, 10 years. Um, I won't bog you down with all the ins and outs of this, but basically, uh, pressure, uh, Jackie Pressure was uh, elected to the Teamsters president in 1983 
um, because he got the nod from all the mobsters together, said, well, all right, he's our guy. Um, the funny thing is he campaigned for the job uh, in 1983 uh, as a clean image, and he was going to throw the mobsters out of, out of the Teamsters. Uh, Jimmy Weasel, Jimmy the Weasel Fratiano testified, he was a gold mine uh, in, in testifying things, that even when pressure, pressure was really low down on the, in the ranks of the Teamsters, that he sent a message to Chicago saying, if you need me to do anything, I'll do it for you. So after 450 hours of testimony and 64 days, the case against Ayupa and all the others went to jury uh, trial and the verdict came back and after 30 hours that they were guilty um, of conspiring to hide their ownership in Las Vegas casinos, skimming profits. Iota, Ayupa at the time was 80 years old, Jackie Cerrone was 73 and they got the stiffest sentences, 28 years. Um, the prosecutors sought to strip them immediately of their freedom, Iota, Iopa, and Cerrone, and they wanted them put in prison then, right then and there. They said in an affidavit that Iopa had either murdered or ordered the murders of at least 14 persons, including CMG and Kana, Alan Dorfman, which was probably true. He was led away in chains to Leavenworth, which was 28 miles from Kansas City. Um, when a Chicago burglar named Joe Panzico, I'm not pronouncing that right, but let me spell it for you, P-A-N-C-Z-K-O, P-A-N-C-Z-K-O. This guy was hysterical. If, if you, you want to look him up and research him, he was really interesting. He sees Iopa in prison, and he says, Iopa recognized me. I asked him how much time he had left, and Iopa said, too goddamn much. Uh, when Iopa entered the prison in 1986, he was technically broke, despite 50 years of earning you know, millions. So what he had done to make himself penniless was to distribute all his ownership of anything to his, to his family. And uh, he got away with that too. However, in jail, he was restricted to $10 a day. Uh, he'd been expecting this, but so he had started putting away all this money years and years before to make sure that it didn't go to the government. Uh, Iopa was really sick and he and uh, another mob boss, uh, Carl Savella of Kansas City, they were sent to the U.S. Bureau of Prisons Hospital in Rochester, Minnesota, which is sort of a campus thing, although it's cold as hell up there. And um, it's close to the Mayo Clinic, which is just a mile away. Iopa's health worsened. He was walking with a cane. Um, it became very severe. He did, got to the point where he didn't understand anything because the blood was being restricted to his brain. Uh, he didn't really know why he was in prison. Uh, in January of 1996, he was released for medical reasons to his nephews and nieces. His wife had died before that in 1983. Uh, Iopa died shortly afterwards uh, at age 89 from the effects of cancer and heart disease and the world will not miss him.